You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. On Event Horizon and my own channel, we spend a large portion of our focus on futurism. Indeed, futurism and all that comes with it is important to what we do as we try to understand this universe in which we live. That's why I'm excited today for us to be sponsored by Kaspersky to discuss Earth 2050 Project. Our world is rapidly changing throughout these past few decades. New inventions, ideas, and technology have had a major impact on the whole of humankind. With this comes some uncertainty. Technology has become essential in our everyday lives, but some fear change, asking if the future is doomed, or could we very well be on the verge of a new era? With Earth 2050, go on a journey with noted scientist and science fiction author David Brin, as we learn more about what challenges we face to live in a world where the physical and virtual interact in new ways. With the Earth 2050 platform, you can use it as both a sci-fi encyclopedia and share your own unique opinions and predictions on what our future will bring us. I notice that you can switch between 2030, 2040 and the year 2050 to see on the map just what predictions are being made about certain places. Right, Anna. You can share predictions, like them and post your own comments on them, telling others what you think this world will be like. View predictions from... Stephen Hoffman, Martin John Rees, and from our friend Isaac Arthur. The work of a futurist is never done, as you know by being a viewer of Event Horizon. Don't miss out on your chance to make predictions about what Earth 2050 will look like. To learn more, follow the link in the description and see the future with your own eyes. Read predictions, leave likes and comments, see illustrations, and even predict the future yourself. In today's episode, John is joined by James L. Cambius. James L. Cambius is an American science fiction and fantasy writer and tabletop game designer. He is the author of A Darkling Sea and has been nominated for the Nebula Award, the James Tiptree Jr. Award and the 2001 John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer. His newest book, The Godel Operation, is science fiction at its sense of wonder best. A wild chase through the billion worlds of the 10th millennium in search of a mythical weapon that could save civilization or doom it. Mining asteroids. That's where we get into something a little bit different because we know that they contain some somewhat weird metals, odd metals like iridium in greater concentrations than what we can find here on Earth. And some people have floated the idea of platinum possibly being profitable to return from a near-Earth asteroid. Do you think that's step one of the making space profitable beyond refueling and things in low-Earth orbit? Do you think the step, next step after that's going to be uh, asteroid mining? Well, certainly the siderophile metals, I mean, as, as far as I understand it, all of the platinum you find on Earth is, was brought here by meteors, that all of Earth's primordial platinum is way down in the core where we can't get at it. So, yes, that would be it. And platinum is not just pretty and expensive, it's useful. You know, it's a metal that has industrial uses. It, it's, you know, used for catalysts and it's used for, uh, you know, it has chemical applications and um, I think some electronic applications too, I'm not sure. So, you know, there would be a, a, a use for platinum and thus, you know, you would not be driven solely by, by novelty value or whatever. I believe the outfit, was it Space Resources Company? Was that they were, they were attempting to come up with techniques for locating and mining near-Earth asteroids. And their plan was to just smelt up big balls of pl platinum and just drop them on a desert somewhere. Not even bothering with any kind of re-entry vehicle because ball of platinum is pretty sturdy. And of course, this does lead to the problem of, uh, you know, making sure nobody's in your drop zone when it comes down. But that, in fact, inspired my second novel, which I wrote back in, in 2015, Corsair, which was about 
a near future story about people pirating shipments of, in this case, it was helium three coming back from the moon to earth for uh, fusion power plants. And I just happened to see in the news a few, uh, a week or so ago that was it U S nuclear company, I think was, had signed a contract with one of the, uh, one of the smaller private space development companies to mine helium three on the moon and return it to earth. So I, I contacted some people who'd read my book and uh, tried to organize a pirate conspiracy to hijack this, but none of them were interested. You know, and that, that, that actually brings up another question. Now, the way helium three accumulates on the moon is over time it's coming off the sun. So it's not a renewable resource, at least not in any time scale. So once it's gone, it's gone as far as the moon goes, at least my understanding. So could there be other repositories of helium three in the solar system? I mean, could you, would you find this in the asteroid belt as well? I mean, would it the same principle apply um, or, you know, well, yeah, I mean, there's certainly other regolith, any body with no atmosphere to speak of and, and plenty of regolith is, you know, you, you can do the same baking it out of regolith method that would be used for, for harvesting from the moon. But I think there's a much more obvious and sustainable res uh, a source of helium three, and that's the solar wind, right? Uh, you know, the, um, the source of the helium three that is in the lunar regolith is the solar wind. And so why, why not eliminate the middle moon and just d develop ways to harvest the solar wind directly? That, in fact, leads to the whole topic of mining the sun, which is definitely down the road a bit, shall we say. You know, I don't think anybody alive is going to be doing that. That is ultimately the, uh, the main re reservoir of, of matter in the solar system, after all, is the sun. And back in the 1980s, a, uh, a physicist named Dave Criswell came up with the idea of what he calls star lifting, where you basically essentially induce giant solar flares steadily, and that gives you a stream of matter you can harvest. Um, his idea was actually to use that to prolong the life of the sun by reducing its mass. Because, of course, we all know smaller stars burn longer, right? So his idea was keep scooping matter off of the sun and parking it out like in the Oort cloud or, or somewhere like that in, I believe, what he referred to as cryogenic globs, which would be basically large self-gravitating masses of, of hydrogen. And just, you know, park all of this, scoop off a whole lot of matter from the sun and park it in the outer solar system to reduce its mass so that it'll extend its burn time. And then as it, you know, in later on in its, in, its, uh, in its life cycle, as the sun, you know, you can throw another log on the fire, so to speak, by, you know, restoring some of these cryogenic globs. That obviously requires really big scale technology, but some of that does crop up in the, the setting of, of Gödel operation. There is a, uh, the, the super artificial intelligences uh, that live in a ring around the sun are, among other things, conducting stellar mining. There's, there's basically these two permanent matter streams coming off of the sun's poles that are being harvested, you know, using essentially, I guess you call them bussard ramjet scoops, you know, big magnetic funnels of some kind. And most of what you'd get would be hydrogen, obviously, but when you're dealing with enormous masses of material, you know, some tiny fraction of it will be, nevertheless, you know, um, um, heavier elements, you know, carbon, iron, whatever. And that would make, that would give you an essentially infinite supply of material. In, in the Gödel operation, there's a, there's a passage fairly late in the book where one of the characters is talking to the others about the power that the, the inner ring, it's called, this, this, group of artificial intelligences that are doing the star mining on the sun have. And she is pointing out that, you know, they could build, the conversation takes place while they're on board a giant space habitat. And she's saying they could build one of these every month forever. And so, you know, forget about mining asteroids, work on mining the sun. 
Now, with mining the sun or extending the sun's life, the big problem is helium. <laughs> because if you want to extend the sun's life, you have to figure out a way to get rid of the helium. That's that's sort of the the thing that I don't think we'll ever get get to, even with stellar lifting, to be able to remove core helium to extend the sun's life. Well, obviously, yeah, you can't dig it out of the core, but right. But, but I think I think ultimately it's probably cheaper and and more desirable just to go find another star at that point, <laughs> or generate energy some other way. One of the other power sources in the far future that I describe is um, microscopic black holes. You, know, you just feed matter into them. It's actually more efficient than fusion. And so, you know, all of the serious large habitats or large weapons or whatever have to have a, their own black hole. My most gonzo over the top creation in that setting is the Exalot laser, which is, you know, it's the next level up from petawatt is exawatt. So, you know, gigawatt, terawatt, petawatt, exawatt. I think it's 10 to the 15th watts. And the exawatt is, is buried inside Pluto for cooling purposes and is powered by not one but six microscopic black holes. <laughs> nice. The, the microscopic black hole idea is really interesting because that's something that we're starting to play with here on Earth is the idea of creating a Planck mass black hole <laughs> in the laboratory. So that may not be that far out. I'm sure fusion energy is closer than that, but it isn't outside of the realm of possibility that someday, you know, thousands of years from now, we may actually be able to create and harness the energy of a black hole. Yeah, and it's more efficient than fusion. So, you know, a, a coldly rational Kardashev two type civilization, I suppose, might really want to just starlift their sun uh, out of existence and use it uh, use all that matter to to fuel uh, black hole power plants. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's interesting, and that 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 sort of makes me wonder about the Fermi paradox because a lot of times when we're talking about techno signatures. We're talking about things like Dyson spheres, you know, which the, the basic idea there is energy collection or Dyson swarms, you know, again, energy collection. But it may be the case that we simply never need that type of energy. You don't need the star because you have black holes and fusion. Yes, and we might find that Freeman Dyson's other big idea about future living space for humanity may become more plausible. He was also the one who came up with the idea of colonizing the Oort cloud. You know, he, he had this idea of building, creating giant, uh, I think he called them star trees, which would g grow on Oort cloud objects and have these vast, you know, really vast canopies to collect uh, the very faint sunlight. But I think it, if you can generate power from uh, a black hole power plant, I think it becomes a lot more feasible, really. And, you know, that conjures up a very different picture of interstellar colonization or whatever, where instead of being like, shall we say, Europeans sailing across the ocean and settling in new lands, you know, starships to other star systems, it might proceed more like the earliest humans who are, you know, my tribe settles the next good hunting ground a few kilometers away and then my kids some of my kids generation go off and settle another good hunting ground a few more kilometers away and it took humans just a few thousand years to spread all over the earth that way and one could imagine something similar going on in the Oort cloud because at some point it becomes very hazy where the sol's Oort cloud ends and other stars Oort cloud begins you could just have this sort of steady unspectacular incremental expansion out there in the dark. Well, in addition to that too, you have passing star systems, you know, stellar encounters where intermingling Oort clouds intermingle and then end up, you know, on the other side of the galaxy from each other. Yeah, and I was, I actually looked this up. There's, I think it's, uh, I think it's Wikipedia has a page of, of stellar events in the future. And I was hoping that there might be a close stellar encounter sometime within the time frame of my novel, but sadly there aren't any. It's just not quite long enough in the future for you know another star to be uh, passing within a couple of light years. 
Yeah, what is the one that's the first one that's slated to pass? I I can't remember off the off the top of my head, but it's it's distant, but not in geologic time distant. No, it's yeah, it's it's long history. I firmly expect there to be humans around when it passes, but it's tens of thousands of years, like I think seventy thousand years, something like that. I think something like that, and then there was seventy thousand years ago was Schultz's star, which was the last one to pass by. But that's still within, you know, humans were walking this planet when that happened. So this isn't, you know, millions of years. It's it's a it's a tens of thousands of years question. Well, that's one of the things which I find almost I, I'm, I almost feel like it's a lack of nerve with a lot of other science fiction writers. Well, and even myself, I suspect, is we, we tend to want to end things soonish. Any number of, of science fiction novels postulate, you know, an, an end to human history one way or another in the next century or maybe the next millennium. My book is fairly unusual in taking a, you know, multi-millennia in the future setting. But if you look at human history in the past, you know, there have been humans, recognizably human humans, for for 50 to 100,000 years. There's no reason to assume there won't be 50 to 100,000 years in the future either. Well, I, I find that, that there is a certain pessimism that a lot of people sort of exhibit and about the human future because it looks like, you know, that we have the potential to go extinct, you know, through nuclear weapons or something like that. But we haven't yet. You know, we made it through the Cold War. We didn't uh, unleash the the barrage. So, you know, you're, you're left wondering, well, maybe we just sort of end up in the situation where survival or survival uh, instincts keep us going. And yeah, we could be here millions of years from now. But what I find, <laughs> what would worry me is if, if, if we got reset, you know, either by uh, just a catastrophe like a, an impact or solar flare destroying all the electronics, and we just simply ended up, or an alien civilization dropping by and saying, you guys are too technological, we're taking it. You know, some scenario like that, where we end up as natural humans again, and we have to start over. That's that's the one that intrigues me. That's an interesting one, although I've never been convinced by a lot of the disaster scenarios. I, like you, I was I grew up, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, so... You know, the Cold War was a real thing for me, too. But I can remember at one point back in the 80s, I was trying to create a post-apocalyptic role-playing game setting for, I think I was planning on running a Gamma World game. You remember that game? And so, you know, uh, it was not hard to find um, um, how many you know, estimates of how many atomic weapons the Russians had and various anti-nuclear weapon uh, organizations were perfectly willing to provide information on, you know, what targets are in the United States or whatever. And so I thought, oh, this will be simple. I'll just draw like a, you know, a little 10 kilometer circle around every every target in the United States. And that'll be my, you know, dead lands. And then the, the scattered remaining survivors will be the nuclei of new civilization. Well, I was very disappointed to discover that there wasn't all that much devastation. I mean, even Carl Sagan had to adopt the as it turned out, flawed uh, a nuclear winter hypothesis to make nuclear war devastating enough to be worth banning nuclear weapons. Um, <laughs> I mean, this sounds kind of weird, but even if you assume that, that, say, the Soviets and the Americans and all their allies unloaded everything they had on each other, who's going to drop atomic bombs on Bolivia, right? Or Thailand or the Republic of the Congo? And those are all large countries with burgeoning industries of their own. You know, the idea that nuclear war means the end of humanity has an uncomfortable sort of, shall we say, skin color related uh, context to it. That, you know, somehow for a lot of people, apparently the idea of a nuclear war would mean the end of European descended humanity and thus, well, what's left, right? <laughs> you know. That's a very dodgy assumption, to put it mildly. So the idea that that you know, that war between the war among the European descended countries equals the end of the world is kind of sort of racist. And even the idea of a nuclear winter, of you know this nuclear exchange sparking a, a 
an ice age, a new ice age, even if it's only temporary. We've done ice ages. We did ice ages with nothing but bone tools and fire and animal furs. Well, also, apparently, we've we've even done an asteroid impact because of the, uh, what was it, the 6th century, where there was a year where something was so bad that, you know, there was a, basically the sun was blocked to a, a certain degree. And, I mean, it could also have been a super volcano or something like that. I don't know if they've ever actually really established what that was, but it was known as the worst year in human history. I think it was, what, 537 AD, somewhere, something like that. Yeah, 500s were definitely a bad time. I, I've, okay, given my age, it's also been amusing to watch scientists, particularly like planetary scientists, switch from the the very hardcore gradualist view to being almost embarrassingly fond of catastrophe explanations. It seems like nowadays, you know, if you can't explain something, it must be a giant impact that did it. That 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 shift happened. I, I saw it too, where it was like the the idea of of you know the iridium layer in the uh, and Cretaceous event. I remember when that was almost fringe science. Yeah. You know that there that this idea of the dinosaurs dying by at the hands of a meteorite that's preposterous. And now you're right. It's <laughs> it's the go to explanation. Well, you see it in in planetary. It, it's crept into other into planetary science in general speculations about you know why uranus's axis is cocked sideways and why venus rotates very slowly backwards and things like that it seems like the 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 go-to explanation is now well it must have been an impact yeah and then i'm sure that well in venus's case i'm sure that'll get revised (laughs) i recently ran a little workshop on world building for uh uh, writers uh, locally and uh, I kept for several things I would I would mark where things were poorly understood and I I was in, in telling this making sure to tell the students that you know poorly understood is something you should look for as a writer because that means no one can tell you it didn't happen the way you wanted to That's true and it also gives you an opportunity to break ground is in uh conceptual stuff because there's certain things in science that to my knowledge, no one's approached because they just simply don't understand it. And I think Stephen Hawking once said that he wished a sci-fi writer would tackle his idea of sideways time and write a story about it, but no one had. And it's because no one understood it. Yeah, I mean, there is the problem that you you have to then get Stephen Hawking. You you have to be able to understand Stephen Hawking and be a good writer. And the pool of people who can do both is very small. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Now, James, where can everybody get the Godel Operation and your other books? Let's see. Godel Operation should be on bookstore shelves now. The publication date was May the 4th. So, And I, I got my sample copies, so it exists. It can be ordered uh, through the Bain Books website or through Amazon, of course. It's available in both physical and ebook editions. There is not an audiobook out yet, but uh, that is likely to change. I don't have the details, though, so I'm not going to. And other books, I believe, can be... All of my other books are still available through through Amazon. My first novel is sadly out of print now, so I don't think you can order it from Tor anymore. And I believe that's also true for Corsair. My two my two novels for Tor, I believe, are out of print now. But I think the, the three I've done for Bain are all still available through their website. All right, we are out of time. James Cambius, thanks for joining us today. I had a great time. I hope you did too.